worship this afternoon. Uh, a few announcements before we begin. Uh, thank you if you have signed up for Easter services. Um, a couple of the services are filling up really quickly, and so to provide opportunities for others to be here in the sanctuary, we've converted the Easter vigil service on Saturday to a resurrection service. So it'll be an opportunity to celebrate with a similar readings and message and hymns as we would have on Sunday morning. So if that's a, a preferred option for you, we uh, encourage you to make part of, take part of that. Uh, also, in the Narthex uh, is a sign-up sheet for Easter flowers. So if you'd like to help adorn our sanctuary uh, for, for Easter weekend, uh, we encourage you to support uh, the efforts that way. So are there any other announcements this day? See none, we begin our worship. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we turn our eyes to Holy Week, we behold Jesus' final public appearance before his trial and crucifixion. He prays, Father, glorify your name. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. People fail to understand who Jesus is. But he encourages them to walk in the light, test the darkness of the Then he hid himself from them. Lord grant that we walk in the light of Christ, lest darkness overtake us. We continue with the hymn. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. 
We stand.
famous last words. Richard B. Mellon, a multimillionaire, was the president of a company called Alcoa. And he and his brother had a little game of tag that went on for about seven decades. And when Richard was on his deathbed, he called his brother over and whispered, by the tag. Andrew remained it for four more years until he died. Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, died at age 71 in his garden. He turned to his wife and said, you are wonderful. And then he clutched his chest and died. Blues singer Bessie Smith died saying these words, I'm going, but I am going in the name of the Lord. And a final example this morning, William Henry Seward, U.S. Secretary of State, the one who architected the Alaska Purchase, he was asked if he had any final words. And he said, nothing, only love one another. If you knew you had the opportunity to say one last thing, what would it be? What would you want people to remember? What would you want them to do? Most of the quotes I gave you seem to be from some more private moments. But what if you had one final public opportunity to make in your life? Would that make a difference? Then what would you say? A gospel this afternoon takes us to the end of the day on Tuesday of Holy Week. It's a, it's a significant section of scripture because it marks the final public appearance by Jesus. It's the last time he and the crowds in Jerusalem will exchange words before he is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, placed on trial and crucified. So what does Jesus want us to remember from his significant final appearance? To answer that, this afternoon we focus on several of the statements he makes. First, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If we had been there, maybe we would not have understood at first. But Jesus is clearly speaking about his coming crucifixion, death, and burial. Now, on several earlier occasions, Jesus had stated that his time had not come. But this time was different. Because now his time had come. Everything is happening according to his timetable, according to the plan that the Father had set. All that Jesus had come into the world to endure, it was time to endure. It was time to accomplish the mission. It was time to do everything that the Father had sent him into the world to achieve. Christ would be glorified, but not in the way that some were expecting. He would not bring about a revolution and establish an earthly kingdom that he would rule with subjects bowing down before him. No, instead he would let others triumph over him. He would actually bow down his head in death on a cross. There he would voluntarily offer his life as payment in full for all sin and all evil. The way to being glorified for Christ was by way of crucifixion. He would not reign from a palace. He would hang from a cross. He would not lie on a luxurious bed of ivory. He would lie on a stone cold of a tomb. He would not be adorned in finest fabrics. He would be wrapped in burial clothes. It is through death that he will bear much fruit. Yes, Jesus compares his own death and burial to a grain of wheat that bears much fruit after it has been dead and buried in the ground. So it is a paradox to be sure. Life comes by way of death. 
The fruit, the life that Jesus is talking about, is ours. Life comes for us by way of Christ's death. By his death, Jesus has destroyed death's power to harm us. He has destroyed sin's power to condemn us. Death is no longer the end, and the grave is not the final resting place. As Jesus said one chapter earlier in the Gospel of John, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. We also see in this final public appearance of our Savior prior to his arrest, a great deal of transparency and vulnerability. Jesus is truly human, and his humanity is on display. As the appointed time is growing closer, he states in our text, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. These words, they remind us of words he will speak about 48 hours later when he is praying to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yes, Jesus knew the horror of what was ahead for him. He knew that it would include being beaten, being whipped, being spat upon, being mocked, and suffering excruciating pain as he hung on that cross. You and I can only imagine what he endured. The pain, the anguish, the suffering, the shame. But nothing could compare to the isolation of being abandoned by his own father as he hung there on the cross suffering and dying. He'd be so troubled that he would cry out for all to hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But sadly, you and I know the answer to that question. It's our fault. Jesus was forsaken because he was bearing our sin, our wrongdoings that should have forever separated us from God, not him. Is it any wonder that Jesus' soul is troubled at this point? Yes, as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, he also does here. He will not let his human emotions and his human desires override the will of his Father. The reason he came into the world, the mission he has come to accomplish. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would be quick to add to his request to let the cup pass from him these words. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so also here he adds the words, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Yes, for this very purpose he came into the world. For this very purpose, he came to this specific moment in time. As he said himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to die so that you and I might live, not just here, but eternally, in the presence of God. And so what would be Christ's final words? The final words of his public appearance that ended it all, that concluded his public ministry prior to his arrest and crucifixion. He says this, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. He issues one final appeal to trust and believe in him. Even as he is facing all of the personal anxiety he is facing, even as he is anticipating all the personal pain he will suffer, his concern is not for himself, but for others. 
He desires that all who are within hearing distance might believe in him, trust in him, have confidence in him as their savior. He and the Father are united in not wanting any to perish. Their deepest desire is that everyone should come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. As a church, as individual members of our Lord's church, our message to those walking in the darkness of sin and unbelief is the same message that Jesus delivers in his final public appearance. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. After all, who knows how many more opportunities they will have, how many chances those outside of faith in Christ Jesus will have to come to the light before the darkness of death closes in and it is too late. So may God use us to bring the light of Jesus to those living in the darkness of sin and unbelief. May he use each one of us, our actions, our words, our example, as instruments of light and life in this world. And so concludes the final public appearance of Jesus before his arrest. An appearance in which he announces his time has come, that he will be buried, that he will produce much fruit. An appearance in which he speaks about his fear and his tribulation concerning the horrific events that he will endure in the next few days. An appearance in which he appeals one last time for faith on behalf of his hearers. It was a significant final public appearance, indeed. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life eternal. Amen. Before we continue our worship, I want to see if there are any specific prayer requests you would like me to include this day. Let's rise for prayer, beginning first with the period. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Amen. 
Please be seated for our closing hymn. 